Oh no, little kitty. Unfortunately, most schools are closed due to the recent pandemic, because of which we can't go in. Kitty miss school. I understand. Hey friends, I'm sure just like little kitty, you all must be missing the learning environment of your school, the sweet sound of the recess bell, and the playful laughter of your classmates. So, in today's episode, let us learn about the history of these institutes of learning and answer an important question. Who invented school? Zoom in! School, a great place to learn new things, educate yourself and make lots of new friends. Sure, exams can be hectic at times, but if it weren't because of school, humanity wouldn't have made so much progress. Yes, my dear friends, the school system is not new, but has existed for thousands of years in ancient cultures like Greece, Rome, India and China. In fact, the concept of education dates back to the very first humans ever to inhabit Earth. As just like animals, Cavemen and women saw the need to pass their skills, knowledge and values to the next generation to help them survive. But as time passed and a more complex society formed, humans understood that it would be better to have a small group of wise adults teach a large group of children about various subjects. And just like that, the concept of the school system took birth. But the early school were more focused on developing combat skills and passing religious beliefs rather than teaching advanced subjects like we learn today. And it continued to do so for thousands of years. But in the mid-17th century, with the rise of the Age of Enlightenment, people started to realize the importance of exploration through reading, writing and mathematics. These New Age ideas became so popular that in 1642, Massachusetts became the first colony to make basic education a requirement and set up various schools for kids in that region. But the credit for a modern version of the school system usually goes to an American politician named Horace Mann, who became the Secretary of Education in Massachusetts in 1837. After he visited Croatia and saw its education arrangement, he set forth his vision for a system of professional teachers who could teach students an organized curriculum of basic content. For this reason, Mann is often called the father of the common school movement. Later, other states quickly followed his system and by 1918, every state required students to complete elementary school. And with time, the system kept improving throughout the 20th century, leading to the advanced system we enjoy today. Remember, my friends, I know the time is challenging for most of us due to the current scenario as we cannot go to school. But even if you are studying from home, consider yourself fortunate as many kids in the world can't afford education due to a lack of support, money and other factors. So always be thankful to your teachers parents and make sure to help the less fortunate ones. Trivia time! Did you know obligatory school attendance became common in parts of Europe during the 18th century? Also, the city Montessori School in Lucknow, India is the largest school in the world in terms of the number of students with more than 32,000 students. Hope you learned something new in today's episode. Until next time, it's me, Dr. Binox, zooming out. Ah, never mind.
Come on, come on fast. Oh, my best friend is coming. Yes, as they say, books are our best friend. And this is not any book, but a book that will tell us about books that I'll share with you in today's episode by answering a bookish question. Who invented books? Zoom in! Books, they are a vital medium for recording information in the form of writing or images printed on pages bonded together and protected by a cover. But more importantly, it is a doorway to our past, a passage to our future, and a chance to escape reality and enter a world of wonderful stories. But the vital question is, what's the story behind these storytelling tools? Well, for that, we need to travel back to the past, nearly 6,000 years ago, and meet the ancient Sumerians who began carving letters on moist clay tablets using a wedge-shaped stylus made of reed. Then the clay was baked in an oven or dried under the sun to harden up, which made the tablets almost indestructible. This method of sharing information continued for the next 2000 years or so until 2400 BCE when ancient Egyptians came up with papyrus scrolls. They were paper-like fabric made from strands of papyrus plants glued together. But handling them was an issue as they were very long, heavy and could also tear easily. So to tackle this problem, the Romans came up with the codex and reduced scrolls in the form of a notebook made of parchment, a material made from untanned animal skin and protected by a wooden cover. But on the other side of the world, around the first century CE, then around 680 and 907 CE, the first books were printed in China using a tedious method called woodblock printing. In this method, the words were carved into wood and stamped onto pages. Then around 1041 to 1048 CE, another Chinese inventor named Bi Sheng invented the process of movable type printing. In this process, the written text could be copied with the use of pre-made character blocks made of clay material. Then, fast forward to the 15th century, a German inventor named Johannes Gutenberg worked on improving the movable type printing method and built the printing press in the 1440s. This allowed the mass production of books in less time and with less cost, which made them easily available for everyone. Then in 1884, the invention of the typewriter led to books being typed instead of handwritten and made the process way easier. And now in modern times, digital or e-books have become popular which allows people to access numerous books on one device. Trivia time! Did you know the first book printed in the printing press was the Gutenberg Bible, published in 1455, which is now on display at the British Library. While the Diamond Sutra, a Buddhist book from Dunhuang, China, from around 868 AD, during the Tang Dynasty, is said to be the oldest known printed book. Hope you learned something new today. Until next time, it's me, Dr. Binox, zooming out.
Never mind. Hey, that's a spelling mistake. Oops, you're right. I made a mistake, but since I'm using a pencil, I can fix it. Oh, sure you can. That's the best thing about me. I'm all about second chances. I allow you to correct your mistakes. Sure you do. So why not talk about you today, Mr. Pencil? Oh, no second thoughts on that idea. Go on, Dr. B. Tell them all about me. So friends, what are we waiting for? Let's talk about the invention of pencils today. Zoom in. Well, before we directly jump onto pencils, I want you to tell me what are pencil leads made of? Are you thinking? Come on, put some pressure on those brain cells. Oh yes, you got that right. Pencil leads are made of graphite. Graphite, huh? I always thought it was actual lead. <laughs> well, graphite was discovered in Borrowdale, England in the early 1500s. The story goes that one fine day, the locals saw some uprooted trees. When they tried to investigate, they came across a strange dark ore underneath. Hey, what's this, mate? I don't know, yeah? Looks like a lump of black sand. Of course not. This is harder than sand. Let's show it to our fellow mates, eh? And they all started thinking about the new strange material. Very soon it was found that the black material leaves its color behind. Oh boy! Yes, this is spectacular! Hey, why don't we mark our sheep with it? Doing that, we'd know which sheep belongs to whom. That's a brilliant idea, mate! And that's how the locals used this black material called graphite to mark their sheep. But isn't it weird? Something solid leaving its color behind? How does that happen, Dr. Binox? Ha! Huh. That's an interesting property of graphite itself. Graphite is made of layers of carbon atoms. These carbon atoms look like flat sheets on top of each other, connected by bonds that are kind of weak. This allows the sheet of carbon atoms to slide easily. So, when you drag a piece of graphite across a piece of paper, it leaves a mark. Wow! Who knew there is so much going on in such a simple looking thing? That's right, my friend. Did you know when people found how messy it was to use a graphite stick, they originally used string or cloth to cover the graphite. Then who came up with the idea of using wood? It is believed that an Italian couple came up with this genius idea in 1560. However, later in 1795, an officer in the Napoleon army, Nicolas Jacques Conte, came up with what we see as modern pencils today. The process was simple. He roasted a mixture of water, clay and graphite at 1900 Fahrenheit and encased a small wooden covering over it. But what's the use of this mixture when graphite worked so well? This mixture helped him create different kinds of pencils. The more the clay the mixture had, the lighter was the stroke of the pencil. And this is how the HB scale was invented. Trivia time! In the HB scale, H stands for hard and B means black. Graphite has been derived from the Greek word graphene, which means to write. So friends, where was graphite discovered? Till the time you rack your brain to come up with the right answer, I'll go make some sketches with me. Tune in next time for more fun facts. This is us zooming out. Oh goodness me, what have you done little kitty? We just painted this wall two days ago. Kitty practice toy. <sighs> I think it's going to cost us a fortune to repaint this. No! What do you mean, little kitty? Oh, yes! The eraser! 
how can I forget about such an important invention that helps us clean our mistakes? So it surely deserves an episode dedicated to them. Hey friends, in today's episode, let us learn about these rubbery inventions we call erasers and look into their history. Zoom in! Erasers are the little wad of rubber that almost like magic undo your mistakes and changes marked by tiny little pencils. These vital inventions can come in various colors, shapes and sizes and can be made of different materials like vinyl, plastic or gum-like materials. Though modern erasers are relatively new inventions, but erasers as a general category can date back as old as writing itself. Yes, before rubber erasers, the ancient Greeks used wax tablets to erase lead or charcoal marks from paper, while other cultures used bits of rough stone such as sandstone or pumice to remove minor errors from parchment or papyrus documents written in ink. And until 1700, the Japanese used soft bread that can be decrusted, moistened and balled up as a way of erasing writing errors. But it was in 1736, a French explorer named Charles Murray de la Condamine came across a few South American native Indians using a particular tree resin to make bouncing balls. So he decided to send these rubbery resins to Europe, prompting intense scientific interest. And over there, the English scientist Joseph Priestley discovered its mystical ability to rub lead pencil marks and called it rubber. Though Joseph Priestley may have discovered rubber's erasing properties, it's the British engineer Edward Nine who is generally credited with developing and marketing the first rubber eraser in Europe. And Nine claimed to have come upon his invention accidentally. Yes, one fine day, while writing, instead of breadcrumbs, he mistakenly picked up a piece of rubber and realized its erasing properties. Soon he began selling rubber erasers that became popular among the masses. But there was a tiny whiny problem with this product, as the rubbers were not durable and would rot. A solution to this rotting problem came in 1839 when an American inventor, Charles Goodyear, accidentally discovered how to vulcanize rubber after dropping a piece of the material treated with sulfur onto a hot stove. This process made rubber long-lasting and helped it achieve the popularity it enjoys today. But how do these erasers wipe the paper clean? Well, it works due to the properties of pencil marks. Yes, you see, the pencil lead is made of graphite, a soft mineral made of crystals and carbon. These graphites are mixed with clay to make hard pencil lead. So when we use this mixture to write on paper, it sticks to the paper's fibers. But as eraser materials are more sticky than fiber particles of paper, the graphite particles end up getting stuck to the eraser instead. Isn't it magical, my friends? Trivia time! Did you know the little erasers on pencil ends are known as plugs? Yes, and those small metal bands containing the plugs are called ferrules. If you found this information interesting, hope you learned something new today. Until next time, it's me, Dr. Binox, zooming out. Mm -hmm.
Never mind. Why is there so much silence in the house? Oh, what are you doing, little kitty? Humbug. <laughs> That's great. Phew! Thanks to the person who invented homework, I can have some peace for a while. Oh, what is it? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Hey friends, I know, just like little kitty, you two want to know about the history of homework. So in today's episode, let us study its past and find an answer to a highly sought after question. Who invented homework? Zoom in! Nobody exactly knows when, where and who invented homework. All we know is that it has been there since the dawn of the traditional education system. As the teachers from ancient India, China, Greece and Rome always asked their students to train beyond schooling hours to hone their combat and artistic skills. But as time passed by, with the rise of the compulsory education system, other complex academic subjects became part of the modern school curriculum. That's when a German philosopher called Johann Gottlieb Fichte felt the need for a home assignment more than ever before and is blamed. <clears throat> I mean, credited for conceiving the modern concept of homework. But his intention was to use homework as a way to increase nationalism and urge citizens to dedicate time to their country. So to demonstrate the power of the nation-state of Germany, students were given mandatory assignments to be completed at home in their personal time. And when Horace Mann, a 19th century American politician and educational reformer, who is blamed, uh, <coughs> sorry again, who is credited for the invention of the modern schooling system, visited Prussia in 1843, he was very impressed and inspired by their teaching method and decided to bring homework into the American education system. Despite the compulsory education, things were going smoothly for kids. But in the 1950s, when things started to heat up between the US and Russia during the Cold War, homework took a drastic turn. Yes, at that time, the Americans and Russians were aggressively pursuing to prove themselves better than each other. So the US education authorities thought that more homework was the best way to ensure that American students didn't fall behind their Soviet counterparts. But soon people realized that putting political agendas on students' shoulders is causing more harm than benefit and many education experts started to raise voices against it. And as a result today, homework is assigned to make learning easier and effective and is limited to students' personal academic goals. So now you know the little history of homework and know whom to blame. <coughs> <clears throat> whom to give credit for it. But remember my friends, although homework can be helpful at times, make sure not to get stressed by it and talk to your parents and teachers if you have difficulty in understanding any subject. And to my dear parents and teachers out there, we need to realize every student is different. Some may be good at academics, while others may be good at sports or arts. So, we need to figure out their strong points and assign tasks accordingly. As Albert Einstein said, Everyone is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, 
it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Think about it. Trivia time! Did you know an Italian teacher, Roberto Nevelis, is often credited with having invented homework? However, due to the lack of historical evidence, this claim appears to be an internet myth. Hope you learned something new today. Until next time, it's me, Dr. Binox, zooming out. Never mind. Stupid pen! Oh, don't blame the pen, little kitty. It's not your usual ball pen, but an ink or fountain pen. So you need to put ink in it. Ink pen? Yes. Just like humans, the pen evolved with time. So in today's episode, let me share a brief history of this great invention we call pen by answering an essential question. Who invented the pen? Zoom in! The creation of the pen has played a significant role in the development of human society. Through it, we were able to retain, communicate, teach and share knowledge and information. The writings of Shakespeare and Virginia Woolf wouldn't exist if they didn't have the tools to save their works physically. But the vital question is, who came up with an idea of a pen in the first place? Well, the first pen was invented around 3000 BC by ancient Egyptians as a tool to write on papyrus scrolls. They made the early pens out of wood and bamboo straws and the ink from soot or ochre combined with beeswax. One end of this tool was cut into the shape of a pen nib or point and then the reed stem was filled with a writing fluid that would flow down to the nib when squeezed. People continued to use reed pens until the Middle Ages, but in the 7th century, they were gradually replaced by quill pens made of flight feathers of large birds like turkey and goose. These pens became an instant hit amongst the people due to their smooth writing and lightweight. It allowed writers to write faster and develop new, more decorative styles of handwriting with smaller letters. And maybe that's the reason of all the writing devices. The quill pen ruled the world for the longest period of history from the 7th until the 19th century. But its hold amongst the people began to tremble when an English inventor named John Mitchell came up with a machine-made steel point pen. These pens work just like the quill that needed to be dipped into the ink, but was less expensive and long-lasting. But a Romanian inventor named Petrache Ponaro found the process of continually dipping the pen into ink for the refill pretty frustrating. So he began to work on an idea of a pen that could hold the ink in a barrel and pass it through the nib. And in 1827, he received a patent for the invention of the first fountain pen. But his design had major flaws as the flow of ink was not controlled and resulted in either no ink or blotting. So it went through many changes throughout the 20th century and was perfected with time. But before it could make a mark in history, the ballpoint pen made its public appearance in 1888 when an American inventor named John J. Loud obtained the first patent for the ballpoint pen. But as his designs had some issues too, 
Another version of the ballpoint pen was introduced by Laszlo Biro, a Hungarian journalist living in Argentina during World War II. He came up with the idea of using quick drying ink instead of the usual India ink and attaching a small metal ball at the nib that rotated. The ball would work to keep the writing pen from drying out and would spread the ink smoothly. Later, he and his brother George Laszlo were granted a new patent for the ball pen and went out to make their first commercial models, biro pens that became hugely successful and reached the hands of everyone. Trivia time! Did you know an average pen can write about 45,000 words before running out of ink? Also, a regular BIC ballpoint pen can draw a line that's almost two kilometers long. That's more than six times longer than the height of the Eiffel Tower. Hope you learned something new today. Until next time, it's me, Dr. Binox, zooming out. Ah, never mind. Oh, you look pretty tense, little kitty. What happened? Oh, well, it means there will be peace for a while around the house. Thanks to the person who invented the exams. Who is it? Well, I'm sure everyone is looking for that person. <laughs> so today, let us end this mystery and reveal the identity of the person who invented exams. Zoom in. The word examination stands for a couple of things. Firstly, it means to deeply observe, inspect or study a certain subject. On the other hand, examination refers to a formal test where a person's knowledge and understanding or mastery of a particular subject is assessed. It helps to qualify for a seat in an academic or government institution or get promoted to the next grade in school or college. But the vital question is, who felt the need to test people in the first place? Well, it all started in the year 605 AD in ancient China, where the Sui dynasty developed a government-organized assessment test known as the Imperial Examination. Its motto was to select candidates for government positions based on merit rather than birth order. Once qualified, the candidates would then join a renowned group of government officials working under the leadership of Emperor Yang of Sui. Later, the Tang Dynasty introduced the concept of written examinations to pick candidates led by Empress Wu Zetian, who reformed the imperial system to allow candidates coming from humble backgrounds. This method worked for many years until it was abolished by China in the year 1905. Then after China, the Britishers adopted the examination system in the year 1806 to assess the potential candidates to serve in Her Majesty's civil service. Later in 1853, the East India Company took this method to India for the selection of civil servants through competitive examinations regardless of race. But the credit for the invention of modern-day academic exam goes to a German-American businessman or professor, Henry Fischel. The reason I say or is because there is no concrete evidence of his identity. Yes, some sources claim him to be a businessman, whereas some other sources say 
there was another person with the same name who was a professor of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at Indiana University. So, according to some hazy historical sources, one out of these two Henry Fischel took the review system and applied it to the education department. In the late 19th century, he created exams to demonstrate students' overall knowledge of subjects and test their capacity to use the acquired knowledge. This technique quickly gained popularity among other teachers and soon the concept of academic tests spread to other parts of the world and became a crucial aspect of different educational systems. Remember my friends, it is absolutely normal to feel a bit nervous about exams. So, make sure to enjoy studying during exams, keep yourselves hydrated, eat a proper diet, exercise a bit, take a break to play. Do whatever you can, but don't let exams stress you out. Because there is so much more to do beyond the academic grades. So, identify your natural talent, find your passion, and be ready to change the world. Trivia time! Did you know Michael Kearney is the youngest graduate in the world? Yes, he received his bachelor's degree in anthropology in 1994 at the age of 10 from the University of South Alabama. Hope you learned something fun today. Until next time, it's me, Dr. Binox, zooming out. Oh, what are you doing, little kitty? Kitty takes a long break. Hmm? Never mind. <laughs>